Uh, well, hello everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, CISION webinar, uh, Turning Measurement Planning into Practice. Uh, my name is Scott Newton. I'm an Insights Director here at CISION, and I'll be your moderator for the next hour. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today um, in what seems to have become the time-honoured uh, tradition uh, from your living rooms, dining rooms, kitchens, uh, attics, or anywhere else that you've been setting up shop since March. Uh, we hope you're all keeping well. Uh, and we also hope that you take something useful from the ideas and the examples that we want to share with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, now, earlier this month, the AMEC Global Summit on Measurement and Evaluation took place in an all new virtual format. And while we have to admit that it may not have been as scenic as we were hoping, we'd been hoping to get to uh, all gather together in Vienna, uh, happily, we still enjoyed uh, two days of really productive conversation and debate on the importance of data-driven measurements and the latest new thinking and approaches in how communicators can hone their success and prove their impact. Now, it's in the context of that summit that we meet today, uh, and we wanted to take this opportunity to highlight for you some of the major outcomes of the summit. We want to share some practical guidelines, but also practical examples to hopefully serve as inspiration and direction for those of you who are thinking about plotting out, implementing, or even just refining ongoing uh, media measurement work. Now, clearly I'm not gonna do this myself, uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by two very distinguished guests uh, to guide us through this subject. Uh, firstly, we're joined by the Global Managing Director of AMEC, uh, Jonna Burke. We'll be asking Jonna about some of the key trends to emerge from the summit and about the newly released third edition of the Barcelona Principles. Uh, I'm also delighted to be joined by Paul Garbett, Associate Director for Communications at CSM Sport and Entertainment. Uh, Cision was really proud to partner recently with Paul and the CSM team who won a gold at the AMEC Awards uh, in the most effective planning, research and evaluation category uh, for the work that they do with racing series Formula E. Um, so just before we get right into it, um, a couple of points of housekeeping. Uh, we are tweeting along using the uh, hashtag planning to practice. So keep an eye on the Cision UK Twitter handle. We'd love to hear from you there. Uh, please submit your questions uh, as they come up in the Q&A panel, and we'll leave some time at the end to answer as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, finally, an on-demand copy of this recording will be made available afterwards, should you suffer any kind of connection issue. And so with that, I'd like to begin, I think, by, by really trying to set out the, uh, the measurement challenge that we're, that we're facing. Um, and, and speaking a little bit towards the challenge that faces any communications professional seeking to make a start in measurement. Um, in my day-to-day -day job, I think this is probably the conversation that I have more than any other, which is what does a good measurement or evaluation program look like in 2020? And I think my answer to that is very consistent, but I've no doubt that at times it might also be frustrating because my answer is often, well, it depends. Um, the truth is that while uh, great measurement programs often share common characteristics, they certainly don't all look the same. Um, across the two days of the AMEX Summit, perhaps the most notable thing that struck me was not only the sophistication, but also the breadth and diversity of the best approaches to measurement. Some of these are focused on harnessing influencers and understanding their impact. Some are tracking a bottom of the funnel conversion. Some are planting seeds for long-term changes in corporate reputation. The breadth of measurement programs according to objectives is massive. And I think for me, uh, there, there really does feel like there is an increasing maturity to the practice uh, of communications measurement. And actually with that maturity comes a really great understanding that each program needs to be somewhat unique. We need to be tailoring our programs so that they are uh, unique to the aims of each individual organization, whether that's a B2B organization or a B2C organization um, or any other type that, that obviously has very, very distinct and particular uh, requirements and ambitions and aims. We need to be very cognizant of what success means for each brand whether that is about enhancing cor uh, corporate reputation, whether that is about uh, pushing uh, prospects through a sales funnel. Um, and we also need to be confident that the, any, uh, any program that we set up um, is fully embedded and also really importantly, fully understood by an incredibly diverse range of internal and sometimes external stakeholders. 
So the challenge, to my mind, that, that we're increasingly facing more, more so now than ever, is really one of customization. Um, the answer is that there is no silver bullet to measurements and a single off-the-shelf solution that will work in all circumstances uh, isn't really a reality. But what there is, is uh, some really great frameworks to help each of us uh, guide, our, guide us each through our uh, measurement programs. Um, first of all, we need the principles to guide the choices that we make. We also need effective planning uh, to ensure that we are attaching uh, the, the measurement program we're embracing to uh, organizational aims. And if we have all of these things and we can combine them with robust and consistent methodologies, that's ultimately what's going to lead us to good practice. And so, as I mentioned at the introduction, uh, the latest uh, Barcelona principles were released by uh, AMEC earlier this month during a virtual summit. Uh, and represent the third iteration since they were introduced in 2010. Uh, those of you who are already familiar with the principles will recognize much in these new additions, uh, but there's been some notable uh, evolution reflecting the latest changes in measurement technology and practices, and indeed in, in best practice thinking. Um, and so I think this is really the great place to start as we've been talking about that move from, from principles to planning to practice. Um, this is really where we can begin. And of course, who better to uh, ask about all of these than, than Jonna? So um, I'd love to bring you in now, Jonna, just to ask you a few questions about uh, how these principles have evolved. Obviously, this is the third iteration. So it's five years, I believe, am I correct, since the, the last iteration of the Barcelona principles. So I'd like to know what you feel has really changed over the last five years and how that's influenced how these principles have developed. Thanks so much, Scott. And yes, it has been five years since we launched the Barcelona Principles 2.0. So we were well overdue for an update based on the evolution of the you know, rapidly changing landscape of communications. A lot of the practices from 2010 are now dated and, and especially those or 2015 are dated, especially those from 2010. So we really try to take a look at this so that this can be the guiding principles for communication efforts. So all of those teams can be aligned and they can be relevant. You know, in order to remain the foundational basis of communication, measurement takes place, the principles needed to evolve. And so what we like to think is that they are now more inclusive for all types of organizations and practitioners. I think as you talked about, you know, there was always this that they were uh, somewhat more corporate, but now that we see more not-for-profits, more NGOs utilizing these in their everyday practice, it's really important that they're irrelevant, that they're relevant to those organizations. I think I like to cite uh, principle number six, which started out as social media can and should be measured. And it evolved in 2015 to social media can and should be measured consistently with other channels. And now in 2020, it's holistic communication measurement and evaluation includes all relevant online and offline channels. And I think that's probably the clearest example of seeing that timeline of where we were with the Barcelona principles and where we are now and understanding that the deployment of this includes all of the online and offline channels. So that's from earned media content, the own the social channels, organic paid search, knowing how all of those elements factor in and work together to be able to drive and outline a successful campaign or program. Absolutely. I think what's one of the things that has struck me is that there's a lot more um, emphasis, I think, now on continual improvement uh, and a more cyclical approach um, where to do media measurement once is, is no longer, you know, you don't just uh, measure once and say, right, I've done that, I've finished now. There's much more of a cyclical approach in terms of it uh, feeding into future planning. So I just wanted to ask you sort of how you think that's evolved and why you think it's so important now that we uh, place that greater emphasis on the cyclical nature of things. I think it's always been important, yet not specifically expressed in the principles. And what drives that is understanding that all of your objectives and all of your programs in order to be relevant are living, breathing part of that ecosystem. And the better you understand that, the more you want to breathe life into those, the more they need to be timely and relevant. And they aren't something that you can just state and then go back in a month or even six months and say, okay, how did we do? 
But as the climate evolves, I mean, one of the great things, if there is, about COVID is I think it really did take all of the preconceptions that an organization has and it tossed them to the side and it became a whole new environment for everyone. And so understanding all of those elements, how that ecosystem works, how you need to be really on top of that on a day-to-day basis. I mean, it was the, the greatest example that, you know, measurements and, and benchmarks that you had taken three days ago, three months ago are now irrelevant. And so understanding how you bring all of that back together and really looking at the the program that you have and knowing, okay, how do we be relevant? Who are the other stakeholders that we need to bring in? What are the environmental factors that have changed and how do those affect our, our data collection, our information, how we're looking to then drive this forward? Is this still a relevant, measurable, smart objective that we have for our organization based on the current climate? Great. And I think uh, I, I kind of, I'm going to dive into a, a, just a couple of the principles that, that I, had, I, I kind of tracked the, the evolution of and, and was really interested to think about. And one of them that, that really stood out to me was, was the first one um, about, about goal setting and, and, and setting measurable goals. And I thought what was so interesting here is how much more emphatic the language has become over the course of uh, over the course of 10 years 10 years ago you know it was uh, almost a recommendation about the importance of goal setting if we're going to do measurement properly um whereas i think now you know uh, those words absolute prerequisite feel like they should be italicized and sort of underlined very heavily um it's a much more emphatic uh, statement um so i'm interested to see to hear about what's driven that change in tone Absolutely. I mean, in 2015, the principal said goal setting and measurement are fundamental to communication and public relations. And this update just takes it one step further. And by demanding that setting goals is an absolute prerequisite, the principals are pushing for PR measurement programs that are built to identify outcomes and measure progress towards those goals. So it's making this, again, part of that environment so it is an everyday approach you know goals start with the change that you want to see and should be founded in research right so making sure that you have those elements in check goals should be defined prior to the start of the campaign or communication program obviously those can evolve but understanding how those are going to play in the everyday are really critical when you have that solid foundation you know considering the time frame of the goals what's realistic for a short term versus a long term and so making that prerequisite language so strong is allowing people to skill and to to level set each of those elements as they're going along. I think one of the most important things is goals are not KPIs, but KPIs can be a component of goals. And so understanding how that plays into your own individual program is really where that individual approach that you talked about in your opening comes into play. And making goals quantitative and qualitative but still very clearly identifying the who, the how, the what, the how much and by when, those are those markers in the sand that you're going to be able to take as a team to be able to cross over and know what's going to be important. And specifically, who are you trying to reach, right? I think um, there was, uh, there was a, a great session in the summit talking about you know, not all Asians are the same. And we were able to have that session because it was driven by some very specific data. And and we make that mistake, I think, as organizations when we say, okay, we need to target women 18 to 25. Well, that's no longer really an option. I mean, we see that there are so many segmentations of that market and understanding that very clearly is going to make you more impactful by what you're trying to have and what you're trying to accomplish. And so making sure and it always goes back to that you're guided by using smart objectives and i often like to say that they're smarter so we have specific measurable achievable relevant time bound the e is they're ethical and the r is are they revolutionizing something within your organization and and those should be those goals that we're trying to do Mm -hmm. so when communication is feeding into those efforts it's definitely playing more to the bottom line. It's playing more to the C-suite. It's playing more as an effective and meaningful role to the to the stakeholders that we're all trying to satisfy. It, interestingly, you sort of mentioned the, the stakeholders. What do you think the main some of the main challenges are when when uh, you know somebody's right at the beginning of their measurement journey and they're trying to think 
you know, what are the goals that I want to measure myself against? What do you think is the some of the key roadblocks or obstacles that they might face? And, you know, uh, especially with regards to how they communicate or, or um, agree on these objectives with the wider organization, what kind of steps do you think they should be going through in order to, in order to overcome that? I think if they don't have very good research at the beginning, they need to be setting those goals and objectives and stating those goals and objectives based on the fact that environmental conditions and more information can evolve and change our goal while always staying tethered and, and grounded to what the overarching organizational goal is. And that's probably the biggest challenge that we see in trying to embrace measurable objectives. Oftentimes they become very tactical because they become so communication focused and they lose sight of how they're going to ladder up into that overall organizational goal and what that's going to look like. And I think when you have those conversations at the onset, understanding, and that's where being very specific is important. This goal is based on the information that we have today. As your understanding, as that breadth of knowledge changes and evolves, you have to be able to go back and recalibrate and reset that so that the stakeholders are satisfied with the results and they understand why there was an evolution, why there was a change. And, and that's what being more specific at the onset is so critical in, in setting those parameters in order to make sure that everyone is on the same page with that understanding. Absolutely. It seems like uh, just, you know, setting a, a single static goal is, is, uh, is, is one of the problems there is what you need to be able to do is actually embrace the fact that the goals can change. Uh, and that's, you know, really how that you feed that, uh, you feed that planning and, and research into your, into your future goals. I, I thought I'd, one other thing I just wanted to pick up on you was you actually mentioned, uh, I've not heard before that the smarter and the, the ethical and, and uh, you know, what's revolutional about, um, about the, uh, you know, the objectives that you're setting. And I thought the, the ethical point was, was a really interesting one. One of the other um, uh, Barcelona principles that's, that's, really, um, that's really evolved over the years is about uh, principle seven, which now reads sort of communications measurements, doesn't read sort of, it absolutely reads, communication measurements and evaluation are rooted in integrity and transparency to drive learning and insights. I think that's really interesting, the integrity and transparency piece. One of the uh, pieces that came up, uh, I think, across a number of different sessions uh, across the summit and was really interesting was about the way now that, you know, we're all using uh, significantly enhanced technology. We're using AI for the first time. We're using, um, you know, different types of technology that maybe, you know, we're not all computer scientists and we don't necessarily have understand how all of these algorithms work underneath the surface. And so I I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about what new challenges that's creating for us in, in terms of ensuring that our communication is really, you know, has that integrity and transparency at the heart of it. Absolutely. I mean, obviously the inclusion of integrity is a nod towards concerns about data privacy and stewardship as the organizations comply with laws like GDPR and try to approach data collection in general more thoughtfully, right? The new rule tries to send the message that measurement isn't purely about data collection, but transparency requires and really mandates that the peer professional is clear about what tools they're used, as well as examine any biases either on the part of the staff doing the, the, the work, the collection of information, the messaging, and that they're built in to determine a time period, right? So make sure that there is a period of when that question was being asked so that you can include and count those external factors that are a part of that and how things might have changed and then use that as a springboard for additional goals and objectives that you're looking at. I mean, I think there's, you know, focus on how that is built in, but also focus on any, any bias that can be included in your program. and. When you're doing that test and when you're very open and transparent within your team, within your organization, you give everyone a chance to be able to say, why are we doing it this way? And the better and the more specifically you have of those elements and how they're included so that you can address bias at the onset, you can address any type of tool limitations so that that can help manage expectations as the program evolves and changes. Great. 
Um, well, thank you so much for that for that quick conversation. I think it's really great to see how some of these uh, principles are evolving and and um, really, you know, pushing forwards. And I think, uh, you know, creating uh, new standards um, for everybody in the industry to meet. Um, I just wanted to offer a reminder to everybody that you can obviously uh, submit your questions into the Q and A, um, and we'll uh, hopefully return to as many of these as we can at the end. Um, but I do want to make sure that we keep on moving on through this journey that we, we spoke about at the beginning from principles and then through to uh, to the planning and ultimately to the practice. Um, and so I want to turn to Paul Garbett from CSM, um, who's going to take us through that journey a little uh, further um, into the planning and execution of a, of a best practice campaign. Uh, so, Paul, it's all yours. Thanks very much and um, good afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody and um, thanks Decision and Scott and the team for, for welcoming us today. It's a really, really interesting discussion. Um, my details are there. Feel free to get in touch with anybody if you, if you do have any questions about um, what I'm going to talk through today and, and perhaps how it could be, apply, could be applied to, to your brand. But um, I'm, I'm Associate Director of Communications at a company called CSM Sport and Entertainment. Um, and we're going to, we've recently won um, an Amec Gold Award, which we were delighted with, working very closely with Decision with for the work that we do in partnership with Formula E and, and really wanted to hopefully give you a bit of a sense of, of why we won it and perhaps what you can learn and, and apply in your, in your own day-to-day -day work. Um, about us, well, we're a, we're a global integrated marketing agency and, and um, working specifically in the in the business of sport and entertainment and and my role is is having the pleasure of leading all of the work that we do in in strategic communications and pr and we tend to work with two types of clients either um, brands who are sponsoring sports and spending a lot of money um, investing in in sport and entertainment partnerships or with rights holders with teams with championships or athletes um, who are looking to boost their boost their profile in the media and one of those um, is the Formula E Championship, the FIA Formula E Championship, which some of you may be familiar with or, or you may not be. Um, if you aren't, um, you can watch the races next week because the, the season's resuming next Wednesday in, in Berlin behind closed doors. And it's, it's well worth a watch because it's, it's the world's first all-electric single-seater racing series. So this is growing sports in the world. It was established only back in 2014 was the very first Formula E race. Um, and it's all about a racing series that exists to develop the, uh, the technology that goes in to create the cars of the future and hopefully a more sustainable planet that we, we live in. And it's gone from strength to strength. Um, you know, a lot of the big automotive manufacturers in the world are involved now. You've got BMW, Porsche, Mercedes, Audi, Jaguar, Nissan, they're all involved. And also... Um, some of the best motor racing drivers in the world. And what makes the sport unique is that it, because of the fact that it's clean and it's, um, it's less noisy than its um, combustion engine counterparts, it can bring motorsport to the masses and take place in cities. So the races take place on the streets of places like Paris, Hong Kong, New York. Um, it's a really exciting sport that, that anybody can win and, and has really uh, sustainability and technology at its heart. So... We were brought in back in 2017 um, and really tasked with how can we make this sport more famous around the world? They, they, they thought that they had a great product and this was about how do we communicate it? How do we take it to, to new audiences? Um, and our role was, was really to put a, put a strategic communications campaign in, in force. Um, and we focused on three things, um, really trying to, to be seen, take the sport to new audiences. Um, we wanted it to be known we wanted to educate journalists and, and, and their audiences about the sport, the technology, which teams and drivers and the, and the partners who were involved. And finally, we wanted it to be loved. We wanted to create new fans and advocates. Um, and, and our role there as the communications team is very much how can, we get, um, how can we get more people to come along to the races? How can we get them to watch on television? Um, how can we communicate the, more action from, from, from the audience? Um, and I think we were very, very good at sort of setting goals, going back to what um, what Joanna and um, and Scott spoke about earlier, is actually there, there are overarching objectives, but how are we going to measure it? How are we going to measure our success? And we very, very quickly partnered with Cision um, to set in place a real robust measurement and evaluation strategy, which has guided our approach and really helped with our planning as well. 
as we've developed developed the campaign. So three years down the line, we've had some fantastic media coverage um, uh, uh, talking about what we were trying to do in, in terms of reaching new audiences, whether that's in the sport media, mainstream sport pages, whether that's on news channels and in the, in the, in the business press or even in, into the lifestyle media in terms of, uh, of growing the profile of our, of our drivers and the people that are involved in the sport. But um, as my team would agree, you know, I have a catchphrase, which is, you know, this coverage is great, but it only counts. It counts for absolutely nothing if it's not measurable. Um, and I think it's really, really important that in all of the campaigns we're doing as communications people, we have measurement at the heart of them um, and, and actually a learning from, from that data as well and implementing it in our planning. So we worked with Cision on a, on a robust monthly report, but also we, we, evaluate, uh, we evaluate our, our, our media impact at the end of the season as well. And, and these are just some of the metrics that we, we're really keen on, on seeing and learning from. So, you know, how frequently are we being seen in the media? Um, and what's the sentiment of the, of the coverage? Are we being seen in the right places? Are we, are we having exponential reach? Um, in terms of taking this sport to the new audiences that I identified earlier. Um, we're interested specifically in, in, in how we're doing in the media that matter most to us. Um, and I think, you know, it's really, it's really, I'm going to come on to in a minute, a point that I think it's really important now that um, communications people are, are super targeted in what they're trying to do and really keeping a close eye on, on the media and the sectors that, that, that most interest your brand. So, um, we were really interested in seeing, are we reaching uh, the right media, not just having this, 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 this great reach? And more importantly, um, how is the communications work that we're doing communicating the sound bites of the series? In other words, are our key messages penetrating? Um, are, we, are we getting cut through with this? Is it just reach and, and noise, or are we actually telling meaningful stories that help communicate the brand purpose behind this, this racing series? Um, and we're also really interested in tracking the profile of our personalities um, and and the teams involved. Because going back earlier, you know, one of the insights when we when we started out this campaign is that um, we need to really grow the profile of the protagonists involved in the sports um, because that's often what interests sports fans particularly. You know, we're all um, we're all sort of interested in the individual endeavours and the and the and the personalities involved. That's a big draw for sport fans. Um, so whether it's a Lewis Hamilton in Formula One or a Roger Federer in tennis or a, a, a Serena Williams, you know, it's, a, it's often the, the personalities that transcend the sport and take it to new audiences. Um, so we wanted to track that and we really wanted to have robust measurement of the drivers who are appearing in media, the executives as well, actually, um, for those of you who are perhaps uh, working in a more... Uh, more B2B environment, and also the teams. Are we building the profile of the teams in the, in the media? Um, we also really wanted to show the value of communications because that's really helpful, particularly when you're working in the world of sport and with a rights holder who has um, sponsors and manufacturers who are investing huge amounts of money um, to be involved in sport. It's really important that we can show them the value that they're getting out of it, both um, in terms of not just media value, but also, as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the more qualitative approach, you know, the being seen as being uh, part of something special that's gathering momentum and is telling meaningful stories in the media. And finally, we wanted to demonstrate ROI to our client, as everybody, I'm sure, does. So um, particularly here, we were interested in, in being able to provide evidence that the work that we were doing in the world of PR was actually helping promote events. It was helping to shift ticket sales. Um, it was helping increase television viewership um, through the coverage that we were that we were placing in in the in the media, um, and that's been a really really important point that we've been we've been tracking as well in our in our monthly reports and our seasonal in our seasonal reports. So, what are what are some of the tips that 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 I could give you if you're maybe at the start of your uh, evaluation journey, or even looking to to involve it all the time. I think the really important one is actually uh, linked to those Barcelona principles that we that we spoke about earlier that that in the in the webinar. And I think it's important that your impact measures, um, the the things that you're monitoring in your in your evaluation, 
they're absolutely in line with the overarching communication objectives that your team has. And even broader than that, perhaps the business objectives as well. I think it's absolutely essential that your measurement is guided by what you're trying to achieve and not just here's a load of industry standard benchmarks that we think we should we should apply to to our work. So I think you know if you're starting a if you're starting a project, I think really have a have, put pen to paper and think about what's the impact we're trying to achieve. How can we show as a comms team benefits to our wider business, whether that is trying to increase sales or increase awareness of a certain product and service. Maybe even building the profile of a CEO is something I hear quite a lot from clients as a as a priority that's placed on on the comms team. I mentioned earlier about having a real laser focus on the media titles that matter to you and your organization. Um, one of the things that we did with Formula E from the outset, this was a global campaign being applied across um, six or seven markets. If you're not careful, that that becomes a very, very big project and you're, 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 you're being too wide ranging in, in, in your media approach. And one of the things that we did from the outset is we set a list of the 100 media titles across the world that were in the sectors that we wanted to reach, so sports, news, and lifestyle, and over-indexed with the target audience we were trying to reach. So I think that's a really good way of giving a campaign focus. You know, it doesn't have to be 100 media titles. It might be 10. Um, it might be specific regional titles in the, the areas that your business operates in. But having a real focus on these are the media that we really want to invest our time in and tracking those uh, on a monthly basis. You know, one of the things that I really like to see is, is just one slide in our report that has a list of all of those 100 media and actually seeing how many times have they covered us in that month, how many times have they covered us so far this year, and then even taking it one step further and then looking in depth at how they're covering us and how that's evolved over a period of time. Because then actually you've got really meaningful data perhaps over a number of years and say, well, we had this, this ambition to be seen in this title. They weren't even covering us uh, three years ago. They had no interest in our brand, and now they're doing so on a regular basis, which is a really, which is a really powerful way of showing the cut through that you're having in your communications work. I also think it's important to regularly review if your key messages are landing. Um, work with your evaluation partner. We spend a lot of time actually working with Cision and seeing, well, okay, are we are we uh, landing our messaging? And if not, do we need to evolve it? Because often that's a really good sign that your comms needs to be slightly uh, refocused. Um, are, are the sound bites of your brand getting across? And if not, don't be afraid to change them. Um, I think is is a, don't be just set in stone that, okay, well, that's our key messaging that's approved by the board and we need to go away and deliver that for the next 12 months. Don't be afraid to think, well, that's not landing. Um, what do we need to do? Um, specifically, if you're working on a global campaign, we, we have a look at that on a local basis. Um, it might be that a message isn't working in Portuguese in Brazil, but it's working very well in, in English or French. So how do we tailor that? How do we get the local insights and make sure that we're, we're landing that message in that market? I think a really interesting thing we've done in the last 12 months is start to introduce competitor benchmarking. I think one of the challenges we all face as, as comms people is we're often uh, reporting to people who aren't experts in communications. And often they will ask the, the question, well, these numbers are great, but what does good look like? Um, how do we compare that to, uh, to, other, to other sectors? How can we start to benchmark that? And it's a really, really difficult question to answer often. And um, what we've started to do is actually dip our toe at the water in terms of providing um, a little bit of benchmarking against what some carefully selected competitors are doing. Now, if you're not careful, that process can be hugely expensive and resource heavy. So maybe just trial doing it in doing it um, in a little bit in the in the first instance. So to give one example of what we did for Formula E, we actually looked at um, another international motorsport series, and we decided that we were going to monitor their coverage across. 10, our top 10 titles on that top 100 list I spoke about earlier. So as well as knowing the media coverage that we're getting, we're also across the media coverage that they're getting in those top 10 titles. And that allows us for a real powerful comparison between how they're performing and how we're performing, both in terms of um, sentiment, but also in terms of our reach and our, our frequency 
Um, so that provides a really nice example, and that's something that anybody could do. You might even just want to pick one media title or one media title in each of your markets to be able to give a comparison. Maybe find out which is your CEO's favorite media title, and then you'll be able to say, well, actually, we're, we're appearing more in print in that title than our competitors. And finally, um, I think it's really important to push your team and your research partners to understand more about the stories behind the data. Um, and I think um, our team at Cision do a fantastic job on this. I think they would probably admit that we're quite a hard client at times because we ask lots of questions and we really push them. Well, that's probably why we've had success in winning these awards because actually we're often interested in understanding why is this happening? I think more too more so often comms people, because we're under pressure and we're, we're, we're working to tight deadlines and we have a lot to do, we can be guilty sometimes of just forwarding on a report to somebody and saying, great, the report's landed, that's job done for another month, let's send that to the board or to our clients or, or whatever and, and, and pat ourselves on the back. And actually, I think it's really important to take stock um, and ask the right questions and say, well, why is it that our reach has risen this month or that this key message has changed or that we're appearing now in, in a certain sector of media. What's the story behind that that we can go away? What are the insights that we can share? Um, to give one example, recently with the work that we do for Formula E, there was a major spike in consumer media coverage, um, which we wanted to have a look into and think, well, what, what, what led that? You know, we've had a big month-on-month -month increase in consumer media coverage, and it was actually all related to the fact that there's a film, a documentary film being made that, that was made about Formula E that was um, executive produced by Leonardo DiCaprio and it was screened on television uh, or in certain countries around the world over a couple of months ago. And actually what we saw is that led to a real spike in consumer media coverage. So being able to identify that and the impact of, of the action and the work that we did around that was, was really helpful. Um, so don't be afraid to ask the right questions and, and look at um, why is it that, that things are happening? Negative sentiment is obviously a really interesting one. You know, and any brand wants to understand what's that peak in negative sentiment. Um, and also, what does good look like? Where were we at last year? Where were we at last month? Um, how are we sort of benchmarking our own success about, again, about what, we've, what we've done before? So a couple of tips in there, but I think a final point is just, um, as we said earlier, don't be afraid to try new things and put things into practice. I think we all know that measurement and evaluation, it takes a lot of work and it actually can be quite costly at times. Um, so, you know, plan it from the outset. Make sure it's in your budgets for the year. Um, make sure that if you're working at an agency like myself, that you're encouraging your clients to do that from the outset. And don't be afraid to start small and build if you start collecting some data at the, at the beginning of a, of a, of a campaign. Thank you so much, Paul. I think, I think that's, that's really, really back to you. Back to you, Scott. Thank you so much. I think that's really interesting and fascinating to hear how the, the journey has evolved. So a couple of questions I, I'd love to ask, ask you about. I think one of the things that's um, so um, obvious from, from the, the heading of your, of your campaign, the Be Seen, Be Known, Be Loved, is actually the, the need that's very intrinsic within that, within that heading mm. for both qualitative and quantitative evaluation. You need, you need to know that you're getting the visibility, but you also need to know that you're getting the right type of coverage. I'm just interested at the start of the journey, how you went about trying to figure out, um, you know, the, on the qualitative side, how you figured out what you were looking for. And, and you mentioned a little bit, I think, about how it evolved. Yeah, I think... Um... The first thing that we wanted to do, you know, the the be seen element is is pretty easy, right? Because it's all about are we re are we are we being seen in the right places? Are we reaching the right audiences? Are we are we getting the message out and broadcasting it? The more difficult bit is actually showing evidence of how we're communicating and growing, uh, educating people, which really focused on our on our key messaging um, and being able to see that evolving over time. So, are we telling stories around sustainability? Are we profiling um, the uh, teams and drivers that are involved in, in the championship? So I think a lot of that comes down to, are you tracking your key messages properly? Um, and also, are you monitoring your influencers correctly as well? Um, and one of the interesting things that we did about how the strategy evolves is 
you know, if we're looking at a, a, a campaign across seven or eight markets, we can actually see which of our drivers in the championship are the most popular amongst the media in those places. Often it's quite obvious because, you know, Felipe Massa drives in Formula E, who's a household name in Brazil. So naturally the media are covering him most. But there's some really interesting ones that cropped up. Um, and what we've managed to do is actually then focus some of our PR activities around those drivers, which therefore carries more impact because there's more interest in them. So that's a good example of how we're using the data to, to really um, influence what we're doing. I mean, another thing that came out was initially um, the founder of Formula E, who's a, who's a great entrepreneur, Alejandro Gag. Um, originally in our media coverage, when we first started tracking influencers, he was very much the driving force. He was the person that was appearing in the media and, 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 and bringing, bringing the sport, uh, being the public face of the sport. As our campaign moved on, the drivers began to come to the fore and actually began to dominate that element of our reporting. So there's, there's, there's ways, I think, of actually of doing this. You need to really have robust impact measures that you're looking out for in coverage. Um, a really good one as well, I think, is is, is are your um, multimedia assets being used as well? You know, are our, our, our media reporting just on um, on on the the basics, or are they including content which shows that you're actually you know communicating at a deeper level? Are they including videos, including photos alongside that? Um, I think it's all about those impact measures and and how you evolve them over time. Great. Um, I'd like to turn to a couple of the questions that we've we've had coming through uh, in the chat. And the first one I just wanted to ask was a, a specific question about uh, when you work on agency side, how you mm -hmm. uh, go about navigating, you know, setting one of these programs up with uh, with your client. Maybe if you don't see eye to eye on on certain certain aspects of yeah. it, and how you go about, you know, um, you know, agreeing on a consistent approach to to this type of program with a client. Well, I think the first thing is that you have to, um, as the experts here, um, make sure that it's on the agenda from day one. And I think we have a we have a really strong belief that if we're working with a client in the world of PR, it has to be measurable. It has to be measurable. There's a there's there's, there's no way of, of, of getting around this. We have to have data from from day one. And I think there is a, there is an argument to say that agencies should actually budget for this in the in the work that they're doing. You know, actually from from the outset, saying, well, if we're going to do this project, we're going to need X to do evaluation, or even actually including it within within their own service offering. So I think that's really important. But I think there is a there is a an, there is ways of doing this without needing to spend a huge amount of money. And I think there's a question, I think, in the chat, particularly around boutique agencies servicing smaller clients. So why not look actually at that, that qualitative piece of work and start doing it yourselves with your team on a small basis? So one of the, one of the things I'd advise is, can you look at establishing a quality score with your client, which might be as simple as, we're going to award a, a sort of apply a gold star to coverage, which is in one of our target titles, because hopefully you've got a list of the media that your client wants to be in. Um, it's coverage which is communicating our key message for the campaign. And perhaps it's including one of our key spokespeople that we're trying to build the profile of. And, and perhaps as well, you're ensuring that that, that is um, that it's positive and it's or it's not negative. So you could apply those principles and almost say, um, we're, we're aiming that in all of the work we're doing is quality scored. It's quality scored. So all of the proactive communications work we're doing, we're going to ensure it ticks off all of these boxes. And they're things that we can all look out for in the media coverage uh, that we're placing, particularly when it's proactive work. So um, I, think, I, think, I think start small. Just start trialling things and looking at, um, looking at what data you can start to gather within your team. Obviously, if you're working on a bigger campaign, it's great to work with a with a partner like a like Cision who can do that at scale. Great. So I think one of the um, one of the other uh, points that you had, had referenced during uh, during your your presentation, which was really interesting, and one of the uh, things about how you relate to the to the broader um, to the broader team is really that piece about about storytelling. And I'm kind of interested mm. in terms of you know when we're gathering all of this data. Uh, what your experience is like in terms of trying to pull all of this data together and, and present it in a way that you 
feel like you can genuinely get engagement and understanding from um, from the from the, the stakeholders that you're working with. Um, so I just wanted to, to ask a little bit about how you find that that final step of the process of converting the data that you need into things that are really yeah. engaged with by the clients. Yeah. Well, I think trial and error is a big thing. Um, we've we've evolved our report um, over the last three years, and it's it's changed in, in in many ways because we get feedback on well, I'd like to see a bit more of this, or I'd like I'd like to see a bit more of that. Um, also, just a really a really basic point: make sure it's visually engaging. Actually, mm -hmm. I think sometimes we can all fall into the trap of um, presenting reports that are quite stats heavy, and 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 perhaps for people who aren't. Um, aren't experts in the world of PR, it can also seem a bit bamboozling. So bring it to life, you know, um, both in terms of graphic design, but also um, in terms of imagery and, and, and making sure that you've got tangibles in there of, you know, headlines and that kind of thing. You know, the first, the first um, page on the report that we provide for Formula E has headline of the month, completely anecdotal. You know, it's not an exact science by any way. It's purely a headline that somebody in our team has thought that's fantastic. You know, that's one that we we should push out there. Um, so that's a that that kind of thing. I think try and also find ways of um, including more anecdotal evidence in your reporting. So another one that we like to do is to show the media titles um, who were actually in attendance at the races throughout the season, which gives a a really nice visual look of the. The, the quality of the outlets who are covering the championship. So I think try and bring your reports to life, um, but also find ways of presenting data in a in a more bite-sized form with perhaps some some you know some longer read stuff in there if people want to go away with it. Fine. I think you need to have a have a balance in there of being able and, and often you know if you've got friends and partners at home they can be experts at this because you can kind of show them a report and say what do you think of that if you've got no knowledge of the world of communications can you read that report and make head and tail of it and understand it and get the point across so don't be afraid to kind of go to other people and and get their view on it thanks very much i think that's uh, really interesting and actually uh, one of the things I'd like to do now is just bring uh, Jonna back in to refer, and I think it's, there's a link from, from this point about how we uh, provide data and insights in a way that's meaningful to the rest of uh, the organisation. Uh, and we've had a couple of questions in the chat specifically around AVEs, um, and there is a, uh, a it receives its in whole uh, dedicated uh, uh, point on the Barcelona principles. I think it's the one that hasn't changed out of the seven um, from, from the last time round. So, Jonna, I just sort of... Uh, you know, just wanted to, to, to turn that over to you in terms of, um, you know, people still having uh, or, or finding that they have, uh, whether that's colleagues or whether that's stakeholders they're working with who are still uh, clinging a little bit to an AVE and just um, talking a little bit about why we think it's a bad idea and how we think we can uh, help to, to move our stakeholders and colleagues away from it. Absolutely. Thanks so much. And I think I would just like to add on first to Paul's response in the um, AMAC planning primer on amacorg.com, the mischief team included the play model, which is the problem, identifying the problem, right? What are your organization and comms objectives? What's the current situation? The what, the why, um, what's going to change? What if X changes? The L is look at the audience. Who are they? How do they behave now? Why? How will their behavior change? Why? The A is ask, how will you earn their attention, right? What content, what channel will be the most effective with these stakeholders and the why? And then the why is yes, right? This is what success looks like. This is how we know we've done it. And so if you go through that model with your client at the beginning and you talk through those environmental, those external factors and what you expect that change to be, this can be a great foundation for setting those goals and objectives and then aligning with what their expectations are on measurement. It's, it's one of those things that um, I, I think was a real aha for me because it's that really simple way to map that out. And when you're having those difficult conversations, especially when they're tied to budget and expectations, it gives you a really nice way to tie that back to the objective. So I just I didn't want to kind of lose that point before going on to talk about 
our favorite principle, <laughs> which is principle five. And you're absolutely right, Scott. It has not changed and it's evolved slightly, right? In uh, 2010, it started that AVEs are not the value of public relations. As we look to make sure that, in, and we saw that there was a more integrated approach in 2015, it was AVs are not the value of communication. And they are still today, AVs are not the value of communication. And while we continue to see a decline in the use of AVEs as a single and solitary metric, um, it is different all around the world. AMIC is a global organization, and so the use cases uh, around the world are very different. Um, but I think it's important to understand what we can do and what not to do. And I think you know what you can do and what you should do is if you must make a comparison between the cost of space or the time from earned versus paid media, use the quality of the coverage see principle four, you know, including negative results and the physical space or the time of the coverage related to the portion or the coverage that is relevant to you. So if you know you are an, an also ran in a New York Times piece that is uh, 20 column inches, you're not going to take all 20 column inches as a positive tonality for your organization when it's an also ran. Um, also, Make sure that you've clearly and transparently defined the metrics that are being used, right? And I think one of the things that we see definitely more as, as AVEs are being used is that they're being used in an index of other metrics as well. So they aren't really used as that single and solitary metric, but they're used as an index because they can be that a telltale provider of, oh, we know that when we start to see a shift here, we're going to start to see a shift in the other numbers and understanding what that looks like for your organization, what some of those um, key indicators can be as you're evolving. But you know, don't use um, AVEs. We actually have a list, there are 22 reasons. There are many, many reasons, I think more than 22, but we defined 22 reasons why you can say no to AVEs. And those are available on the Amic org site. And it gives you, I think, those great conversation that you know, you can use those as a, as a basis in an index, but why they are flawed, it goes through some of those. And I think that the most important part about AVs is that we don't create a new AVE because people are in such a hurry to get rid of this AVE. And I think, you know, that's where the integrity and the ethics come in of understanding what are those elements and components involved in the metrics that you are using? What are the potential flaws? What are the potential disconnects? So we aren't just replicating and, oh, we're not using AVEs anymore, but we are using, you know, the left-handed index finger metric that we've determined is the end-all be-all for everything. And so, you know, it's with so much data coming out, people, I think there is a, a propensity to adopt other things. And I think, again, you have to look at things holistically and you have to understand and be very clear about what those metrics are, what defines those, how they're aggregated, how that data is collected. So as you see a shift in cookies, in changes to anything else that we see, you're obviously going to see a significant data shift to, to mirror that. Very long answer, <laughs> but all, But all really interesting and, and I absolutely agree, very important. Um, so, um, I, I thought the other thing I'd, I'd just like to turn over to you was something that, that Paula picked up on um, um, during one of the questions, which is around particularly for smaller organisations, for boutique agencies or for SMEs um, who are looking to you know, get started on a measurement journey and have vast resources. And obviously there's a lot, there's a huge array of different things you can do. Just thought what, what advice you might have in terms of using some of the models and the um, and the principles that you've laid out and how they can be applied on a, on a micro level as well as a macro one? There are a couple of things that I would suggest for everyone, but that are especially relevant for some boutique agencies. And um, they, they obviously circle around the AMEC resources that we have because we've identified that as an area where we can help to make education a priority. The first is the measurement maturity mapper. And if you're a boutique agency and you go through this exercise with your client or on your client's behalf, what it's going to do is within about eight minutes and some um, questions, give you a prescriptive and a baseline of where you are. Are you at a basic level? Are you at an intermediate level? Or are you at an advanced level as far as how you're working with your measurement and evaluation program? And 
wherever you are in your level set, if you're at basic or at intermediate, it's going to give you the steps that you can take and to apply to get to that next level. And the reason why I think this has been so embraced by the community is that it gives them kind of a third party, non-commercial endorsed environment to be able to say, these are the best practices. This is what you would need to do next. And in the absence of those best practices, here's what we can do as a supplement. Here's how we can bridge to get to that level. I think the more that um, you're consulting with your client, bringing them kind of the best thinking, the most valuable thinking, this is going to bring you into a more valued role so that when you do have to give them the tough advice, the tough information, the tough feedback and the facts, it's going to be more meaningful because they know that all of this information was aggregated and correlated in, in a meaningful way as well. And I would just say that when you're looking at some of these data sets and, and trying to set these objectives, understanding how your client and or your own organization makes and spends money is absolutely critical. Because then when they're coming to you with a specific campaign, with a specific initiative, you then have the ability to ask the question, how does this affect X? If we're going to impact the organization, how does this ladder up into how your organization makes and spends money? And that gives you a greater facet to tie into and to anchor for what you're trying to do and how that's going to make a bigger change and a bigger um, impact in the initiative. Great, fantastic. So uh, we're coming up to time, but I've just got a final question that I'd like to ask of, of both of our guests today. Um, and that's really a, a, the forward-facing question. So perhaps if I start with Paul, um, we obviously we've spoken today a lot about how we uh, how we're continually um, you know looking to evolve and change and improve the way that we're measuring. And I wonder what your uh, ideas are in terms of how you're going to be taking uh, your measurement approach and, and trying to continue yep. evolve and pioneer over the next several years. Yeah, well, I firstly, I think, you know, it would be a miss to talk about the future if we if we did mention uh, the C word um, of COVID, because it's definitely, you know, we all know it's changed the world. Um, it's changed the world in which we live in. And actually, it's going to change communications. And I think what we've seen over the last few months is the real value in communications. You know, you've seen it needed more than ever before in terms of whether that's dealing with crisis or finding ways to engage your audiences who are at home and perhaps um, finding ways to engage people away from the mainstream media as well, or, or even perhaps um, seeing more engagement in the mainstream media because it's what people trust at a time of misinformation. So I think, firstly, the value of communications has never been higher, and there's going to be a lot of demand on those of us who specialise in this over, over the next uh, few months and years because everybody's going to be concerned about their brand reputation and, and how they can also communicate effectively off the, off the back of this crisis. So with that, um, it, the, the need for measurement is going to be, be greater as well. Um, and I think um, sentiment is going to be a real key thing, I think, in the, in, the, in, the, in the future, because everybody across the industry, no matter what sector they're in, um, is going to be asked of, well, what's our brand reputation? What's our sentiment? Um, how have we come out the back of a period of crisis? So I think that's going to be really important to be to be measuring, as well as I guess your um, your position and and how your communications are helping position your brand and actually your brand purpose. There's some really interesting data that's come out in the last few months that shows that consumers are actually going to their their opinion of brands um, is really based on how they've performed in this crisis actually is a, is a real strong one. I mean, we can all think of brands that have um, come out of this crisis really positively and had really strong messages and really strong brand purpose. And we know those who haven't. You need to look at perhaps the, the travel sector for that. You know, lots of people complaining about the fact that refunds haven't been issued and, and so on. There's been, some real, um, there's been some real heroes and villains of this crisis. So I think it's going to be really important in comms moving forward that that brand message is coming across, that brand purpose, which is where your messaging tracking is essential and your sentiment. Absolutely. We made it some 56 minutes, I think, without talking about coronavirus, but I think it was uh, essential and important that we did. Um, John, just to wrap up finally with you, I'm going to ask you the, uh, I think, incredibly unfair question of projecting forward to the Barcelona Principles 4.0. 
uh, and, and trying to think about what direction you think uh, things are traveling in and, and maybe some of your thoughts about how you feel uh, certain principles or certain methodologies are going to continue to evolve. So I would just add on to what Paul said in looking at the environment, because I think one of the things that we've seen that has been surprising to a lot of brands during COVID is the lack of impact of influencers and the gravitation back to the brand specific message. So I think understanding those implications and how that environment changed pretty much overnight is really critical and important. And part of that is around, I think, AI and you know, everyone needs to remember that it is artificial intelligence. And, you know, I would caution everyone to, you know, understand that in just pushing reports to anyone, to any stakeholder, that artificial does not become the leading driver because artificial can also lead to artificial guidance of what you're trying to do. And making sure that you always level in that context of the environmental factors that AI is great and machine learning are great at kind of counts and amounts and nuance and clustering of a lot of information, but it doesn't necessarily have that context driven model. One of my favorite examples from uh, the summit was Jamin Spitzer from Microsoft shared his example of a system that they have that goes out and automatically checks hotel rates. And surprisingly or not, the conference hotel rate he had left that active was going down. Well, of course it was because there was zero occupancy at any hotel. But, you know, AI is great at doing some of those things, but it didn't have the context that even though the rate was going down, could the hotel accommodate people? Was it even valid that anyone could stay there in the first place? And so it's so critical that people always be thinking and layering in the context of what they know and what those external factors are. And I would say that I would look for the principles to integrate and to change that they're going to be taking in all of that consideration. I don't know that 4.0 will come in five years. It might come sooner. I think, you know, there are elements that we need to be very practical and pragmatic on of what those external factors are. But I think that the basis and the foundation of good measurement and good evaluation is always based on level set on research. I would challenge everyone as they're looking you know only at media coverage to create their own index are they conducting surveys how does their seo compare what are those elements of their own crm data that might be aligned or that can prompt and trigger some topics and subjects that they could then start to feed that as um, some research data into the media to kind of create that broader footprint and to make sure that as you're focusing in on um, key target media you don't lose all perspective of what that other cycle is going on around you because that can help definitely give you some context. So um, I just want to thank Cision for being a, a great partner, a great member of AMAC, and a great sponsor of this webinar to give us the forum to be able to talk. And it was wonderful hearing from Paul and their expertise. And congratulations to them again for being an AMAC award winner. Well, I'd also like to take the opportunity to uh, to thank everybody for joining us, to thank our panelists today uh, for offering your time and for your views. Um, thanks to the Cision Marketing and Events team who uh, have kept this show on the road. Um, uh, and of course, most importantly, to everybody who's joined us as well. Um, we hope that you uh, uh, found some uh, interesting and, and stimulating uh, ideas to take out of the session. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, thanks very much and have a good afternoon.